to 20 to 15 to 10 to 5 and we finally shut the doors the 70 people all went home no job so i was really ticked you can't get madder than i was then because i had created something that was so successful the problem was probably because i thought about the copiers which you could copy a fiberglass body and a hood and a dashboard in a matter of a day, if you know what you're doing. In a week, you can polish that mold and put it on wheels and be taking orders in one week. And I had, sp I had spent one year and three months. See, I, I guess I couldn't see anything else but the unfairness of it. The, the way that the old judge that ruled against me was he didn't believe anything I had to say and the, the lawyer, the other lawyer was probably a really good guy but he knew what he had to do and that was make the judge think I was a thief. And so that was what happened. And I wasn't a thief. In fact, I thought a courtroom was a room full of truth and I've discovered wrong. And so I was thrashed and I, I, I went away from it all and said, I don't want to hear about dune buggies forever. And I went back to doing things that I used to do, build boats, and I restored a Rolls, a Rolls Royce limousine, and built a house in Baja, and did all other stuff. Along the way, I meet Winnie. That was the best thing that happened. And Winnie and I came together, and she has a lot of wonderful spirit, and she's a great organizer. And we had just been invited to France by Jackie Morel, a French guy that was a publisher of a magazine called Hot VW, is a, yeah, Super VW. Um, he had several magazines, Super Track, Super Skid, Super whatever the hell. And he said, I have a, a gathering of French kids here that love Volkswagens. There was something like 2,000 of them. And there was 1,100 of them that wanted to go around the Lamar racetrack. And they wanted to be led by me and another couple hundred fiberglass dune buggies. There were copies. I had looked in them and seen all my, my little things that showed that they were copied from Mars. So I, I told him, I said, I'm not going to lead, and I'll use a terrible word those uh-uh anywhere they ruined me they they broke my life he said you're still angry and it's 24 years you mean to say you're angry for 24 years that's too big a chunk out of your life he says don't you know that half of the people that screwed you are dead and the other half don't give a crap be real you know what you did you saw the, those two smiling faces in every dune buggy is what you did. They're happy and you're unhappy. Uh-uh, they're yours. Just think of only the two smiling faces to hell with where the buggy came from. By that time, there was over 250 copies of the fiberglass dune buggy. It had gone around the world and Winnie and I have been a lot of places around the world and yes, it's true. They're all over the place. and. He says, if you don't do this, you, you're going to die because anger has a, something in your blood. It'll make you die sooner than otherwise. He says, so save yourself. Just think of the two smiling faces and do another thing. Go home and start a club and write a book and build a new max. And I did all that stuff. You know what happened? I, I learned how to not be angry. I fixed on the smiling faces. I didn't care where they came from. I don't care where your club comes from. Your dune buggy's a copy, so what? Who cares? It's done. I had to accept all that. He was so right, I could not ignore what his advice was. It's a choice. It's a choice in life. You can be happy or you can be sad. And he showed me the choice. I was worrying about Memories, bad memories. I carried them with me. 
Here I was 24 years later after being shooed out of business. The only thing I guess that got to me was that I spent 15 months building the Myers Manx because I'm a very fussy guy and I'm a good craftsman and I knew all about the technique of the fiberglass because that's what I had been doing for the sailboat world. You know that if you go to a harbor today, you don't see any wooden boats. They're all fiberglass, aluminum mass, all that stuff. It's because they're available. A, a, a handmade dune buggy can take months to build. It's a love affair and that's good, but months, when fiberglass can go from months to a day or a two and you have a body, see the whole thing was made available by going to fiberglass. The fiberglass is what changed the whole thing, is the technique, and I was the lucky guy to know that. So what he did with me was he sent me home working my ass off to remember to not be angry. And I got so used to saying I love people that I can't do anything else today. I love you, all of you. you. It's a hell of a lot easier too. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what more to say except that I had my l line changed, my, my whole opinion of the world around me changed. And I've seen so many people, happy faces in those dune buggies, to know that I'm the guy that brought them to that. It's, it's all about making happiness. And what I did was record-breaking. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Hey, Bruce, I, w I wonder, you know, I see a lot of patriots in front of us. You shared a story with uh, Jim Cruze and I this morning about uh, you falling asleep on duty. <laughs> Would you share that with this audience, please? <laughs> I, 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 you know, yesterday being the 75th anniversary of the landing on Normandy, we would all be speaking German if it weren't for patriots like you. And uh, I think everybody would enjoy hearing that story. It's a reality. Uh, unfortunately, that generation of the greatest Americans are disappearing at a rapid rate of like 400 people a day. And those stories will be history. They are history. But to hear them from someone, would you share that with our audience here, please? What, what Mike is alluding to is that when I was 17, I had decided to be a sailor. And I got in the Merchant Marine. And then I took one ship to Hawaii. I did my duty, I steered the ship, I chipped the paint, I did all that stuff. But when I got to Hawaii, the ship alongside of us was another tanker and it was high and dry. Now you know, during the war, if a, there's a ship that's up in the air, it's going home. It's not going out to the war. So it was on its way home. I snuck across, I went on board that ship, got into another lifeboat, and finally, the next day out at sea, I came out of the lifeboat and I crawled up to the bridge and the mate is sitting there on a stool. He says, who are you? I'm a stowaway. Oh my God. Captain, we got a stowaway up here. The captain comes up and he's a great big handsome man, silver haired. He looked at me, he says, son, what are you doing here? Well, I was chased off that other ship. Well, what are we gonna do? Where am I going to put you? What am I going to tell that captain? They're, they're shorthand, and so all that went past. I came back home. I hitchhiked back home, and I got drafted into the Navy because I screwed around on the beach too long playing volleyball. Then my sister came down and said, Bruce, you got a letter from the War Department. It says, greetings. And so I was in the Navy. Well, as I stood in a line with a bunch of other 18-year-olds, and I got to the, this officer behind a desk, and he had been telling everybody to the Army, the Army, the Army. And he says, Army, to me. I said, but I'm already a sailor. He says, what do you mean? I'm, I said, I was in the Merchant Marine, and I screwed off too long and got drafted. All right, Navy. See, that was a fork in the road. And the fork in the road led me to the Bunker Hill, which was the flagship of the largest ever in history flotilla of ships, armament, men, guns, airplanes, all that. 
If you went up 10,000 feet and looked, you couldn't see them over the edge of the horizon. Hundreds of ships. I was on the ship that led the whole thing, the Bunker Hill. And the only admiral, Mark Mitcher, was on board that ship guiding the whole thing. Now, I'm in a gun tub during the day shooting kamikazes. That was a lot of fun. But at night, I stood watch in a gun turret. I didn't do any action there, but I stood in the gun turret at night. And every five minutes, there's a note to see if you're alive on, on your feet. And they say, mount one, click. Mount one, I. Mount two, click. Mount two, I. And they got around to mount seven. Mount seven, <laughs> I'm asleep. Not good. And all of a sudden, there's a switch and a great big noise, and, and there's a, a guy yelling, You're, get that sailor up here. And I didn't know where up here was. It was up to the bridge and to air forward, where there's a big map of airplanes flying around at night. And I, I walked up to the bridge and knocked on the door, and the Admiral opened the door. He had anchors on his on his lapel. I'm talking to the guy that led the whole thing. I said, I'm looking for air forward, sir. Right up there, sailor. Click. A lot of saluting. And I crawl up this place way up high. It's the tallest point of the ship. It's 150 feet above the sea, and it's air forward. It, what it is, it's a radar shack with two guys in it. The two guys are both lieutenants. And they open the door. When I'm knocking on the door, are you the sailor that fell asleep? Aye, aye, sir. All right, I'm going to teach you to keep your eyes open. You see that ladder art over there? Go up, up on top and stand at attention. Now, that ladder led to the crow's nest, which is the highest point on the Bunker Hill, 150 feet above the sea. It's, uh, I'm in shirt sleeves. It's cold. It's uh, 3 in the morning. And I go up there. And as soon as I stand at attention, the door is open. He sees me. I'm at attention. And then the door shuts, and I relax. And this went on for minutes, for another two and a half hours. I'm up there, and I watch the sun come up from the east, and it's pink. And it shines on a volcano. That's Mount Fujiyama. That's the biggest of the mountains in Japan. I'll never forget the pink mountain from that early morning. And every time the door opened down below with the orange glow coming out, I'd stand at attention. And then I'd go back to shaking and cold. And at the end of the watch, I came down. He says, all right, sailor, you're, gonna, I'm gonna, you're on a report, which means you can be shot. A day and a half later, we were kamikaze horribly. There was a flight on the after deck. All the wings were folded up, 17 airplanes with all their crews running around below them, engines running, pilots in them. And the first kamikaze comes down low and jumps up in the air and comes down in the middle of these, splattering them all over the place and out into the sea. And the other guy landed in the corner of the the bridge right against the deck, and he blew the second elevator off the ship. So those two guys started the biggest fire we've ever heard of. There was a, a firing station or a, a fueling station that f could fuel an airplane on deck or down below in, in the hangar deck, and that ruptured all the, and that gasoline came out under pressure all over the hangar deck. The hangar deck is a piece of metal that's six inches thick. And this fire blazed up into the ready rooms above, which are full of pilots and other shops. And the, the ready rooms were all just frying pans. I was pushed out into the stern because that's where I happened to be. And here comes 300 men. And I, I get pushed clear out to over, behind a 40 millimeter mount. I was trying to talk a guy next to me into jumping into the sea. He was probably a farm boy from someplace. 
he was frightened to death of the sea. I said, no, it's no big deal. See all the bubbles? They're, they'll soften it for you from the wake of the ship. And the ship is still banging along. Well, anyway, I, tr I tried over and over to get him to jump, and he wouldn't, so I finally jumped. I wound up taking my, I was an ex-lifeguard and surfer and all that stuff, so I, I didn't need my jacket. I took it off and gave it to a panicky sailor that was crawling all over me. And then I swam off to a, a pilot that was bobbing up and down in his May West. His eyes were on me, but his, he couldn't seem to speak. His hands were all burned, the skin hanging down from the quick of the nails. He must have been up there on the deck in one of those planes. And I towed him for about two hours to a whaleboat from a destroyer that had stopped. And they had put their whaleboats out to pick up people. And I, I swam up to them with the two pilots, and the, or the pilot, and they offered to take me on board. And I said, no, I'll be OK. And I swam over to the destroyer. Anyway, on board the destroyer, here's my the man that ran my company. And he was just a lieutenant. He says, Myers, are you OK? I said, yeah, I seem to be OK. He says, well, let's go back on board. Well, I didn't really want to do that. He says, come on, we, they need us. Because there's been, been a fire that killed 1,900 men of 3,500. That's a little bit over half, isn't it? I spent three weeks on the end of a stretcher. I was just a swabby. There's a stretcher with a, two swabbies on it and a, a lieutenant or somebody leading him down into the pit of God. The bunks were full of dead people. The lockers were full of dead people. The air shafts were full of dead people in panic, trying to get away from all this. And they all died. And that's what I spent three weeks doing, coming down with, with all these shipmates. You know, I think of that time in my life when I, I wonder why I was the guy to create something that brought so much happiness. Isn't that something? Was the dune buggy some sort of a balance? I don't know. One of those mysteries of life, huh? Anyway, that's my story. Maybe that's the reason for the dune buggy. I'm not sure. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Bruce. That was awesome. You know, I, I did a little research this morning after you told me that story, and there was another gentleman that became famous on the Bunker Hill, a guy by the name of Paul Newman. You may yes, have heard him. Yes, <laughs> he was a He was a, a TBF uh, crew member. TBFs were uh, three people. There was a gunner and a... And a radio operator and the pilot. Go ahead. Well, God bless you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Bruce. I wished I had known Paul N Newman. I knew, I heard that story more recently. Anyway, whatever happens in your life is kind of a mystery, isn't it? I can't tell you why or how, but I was dished something that made something else happen, I think. I have a kind of a weird, mysterious feeling about all that. I'm sorry to be, bring you such a touching tale. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>